So uh, we can uh, discuss uh, later whether it's a hype or not. I think uh, a couple of things that I would like to address is that, yes, we have always uh, been subject to something called Amara's law, which says that we always overestimate technology's effect on our society and life in the short term, but underestimate it in the long term. And uh, we've had AI since 1956, since the Dartmouth conference, and there were several huge breakthroughs, and we've always thought that, you know, now it's going to happen. But I really believe that this time it's not a hype. And if you look at how much money is invested in AI, in uh, both Silicon Valley, but also in China, you will see that there are very different approaches to creating value based on AI. And I'm seriously worried about Europe. And I think that the five or the seven um, ethical or societal or legal aspects of AI that we like to worry about um, is uh, in many ways um, damaging our competitiveness. And we can discuss in the panel. <laughs> uh, the other thing that I, I also wanted to say is that um, a really important point about uh, what Eva was making at the end is that AI is not a technical project, it's not an IT project, it's a process and it's an organizational transformation. And the book, uh, Competing in the Age of AI, is actually written before uh, Generative AI took the world by the storm. So it really is a book about uh, digital transformation. And many people say, well, it hasn't created value. How do you measure value creation? That's the kind of dark secret of digital age. But if you look, um, well, we still have as many people doing the job. We still, you know, are making the same amount of money as before, even though we are much more digital. But the last 20 years were about creating the databases for being able to do the breakthroughs with AI that we are able to do now. And the next two years will probably redefine the world that we live in. And uh, the fascinating thing is that this is leadership, as Eva was showing us. This is very much sociology and psychology, as uh, Hilde was talking about. And um, for um, the Valentine's Day, uh, 14th of February, I had a podcast um, with a, a fantastic lady from Sintef, who is a psychologist. And uh, she has been studying an AI system called Replica. And it is a system where you actually have a relationship uh, with a software that uh, was originally created to help people with mental problems of certain kind. Uh, but now, and post-traumatic uh, stress disorders, etc., as a therapeutic tool. Uh, but now it is really uh, the, most re uh, re the most important relationship in the lives of many of these people. And then you can discuss, is this a tool to alleviate the problem of loneliness in this world? Or is this going to be, uh, you know, the most uh, best-selling product in the future? And this is why it's important to follow on what's going on with AI, with uh, Elon Musk's Neuralink, with uh, all these things, Affectiva I mentioned, this is going to be a, uh, an integrated part of our lives five years from now. And if we want to understand the world that we are moving into in a very short amount of time, we need to care about AI. And there are many, many ways to care about it, really interestingly. Our next speaker is uh, a lady I met about a week ago, two weeks ago, and we went public about our relationship in a podcast, <laughs> uh, which is uh, actually airing today with Learn. Uh, uh, she's uh, Rebecca Viborg uh, Seifart, and um, she has more than 10 years of experience working with data, AI, and machine learning. She's very much a technologist, and she's passionate about building product and practical use cases where AI can make a difference. She's currently working as um, a VP of engineering at Volur, uh, where data and AI is used to make a more sustainable and optimized meat industry. And in these vegetarian and vegan times, it was a really, really interesting thing about, you know, do you want to optimize meat production? And isn't that also a super important part of sustainability in a world where more than half of the population is still going to live on proteins based on meat? Uh, how can you do that in a way that actually makes this world a better place, not just makes more money for your company? Before joining Volur, um, she spent five years at Cognite. Uh, and outside the work, Rebecca enjoys skiing, running and traveling, and spending time with friends and family, including her two children. And I have to add, after 
both Eva and uh, Rebecca, and then, I don't know, maybe Hilda and Isla are fantastic skiers. I suck at skiing. And it's perfectly fine not to be great at everything. Just find one thing that you're really passionate about and good at. Rebecca. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, I was uh, asked to share a bit about my journey in uh, AI and tech today. So I'll actually mostly be talking about myself and, uh, and kind of what I learned uh, along the way. But I wanted to start a bit about, and it goes really well with what you talked about it and why we're here and why it's important that we talk about it. Because AI is, at least in Norway, a very man-dominated um, field. And why is this a problem? So one of my colleagues, she then asked ChatGPT the other day, can you make a picture for me of a VP of engineering or a CEO? And, and these are the pictures it came with. And of course, it's not a surprise, right? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's what we expect. But uh, when, when it comes to AI and it being such an <laughs> important uh, thing of, of how the world is changing, having a team that is uh, not diverse will, will also influence the product that comes out. Uh, and that's why it's really important that we're here today and that uh, we get more uh, women to join uh, yeah, um, developing AI. Um, so I just, uh, yeah, a bit about me. So I, I started with math and I was thinking about it when you talked, Hilde, like what kind of made me go from there. So when I did math and statistics at university, I didn't know about AI or data science. I never heard those terms before. Um, so it was when I kind of, uh, after a few years at the University of Oslo and also a bit of uh, traveling along the way, I was like, what should I do? And um, uh, to me, there was really <laughs> just two choices. Or maybe three. I could do a PhD, which I considered. And then a lot of people at math at the University of Oslo, they ended up as actuaries, which is a insurance mathematicians or a consultant. And I kind of went with a safe choice. And I went into actuarial science, uh, working with pensions. Um, and, um, but I quickly realized that that wasn't really what I wanted to do. And uh, um, so I, I stayed there a few years, like I learned a lot, but it was uh, more about law really than numbers. So I kind of went back to the thinking bubble and then um, kind of on a coincidence, I came over a um, job description for uh, fin.no describing like this role, uh, which was a data scientist. I never heard the term before. Um, and I thought like this is applied statistics. Uh, and I applied, and then that's kind of how I kind of fell into uh, the field of data science. And to me, that's like an important thing to also think about, and it, it uh, goes well with what the others said that, um, yeah, it might come later. You might change your mind. It might like happen uh, as you go. Um, so anyway, I started at Finn uh, in uh, May 2015. So a long time ago, I was like a data scientist slash analyst. But I had, yeah, so I had done math and statistics, and, but I never heard of machine learning. I never heard of like a lot of the things that we were doing in that field. So I went to Coursera and I did a lot of stuff because I, I felt this passion for it. And um, so then my kind of next thing was when you then find something and you find it interesting, uh, really like put in that time to kind of upskill yourself and, and uh, uh, yeah, just there's so much, and now, like this is many years ago, now there's just tons of material and uh, tutorials and getting started guides and so on. Um, and for me, that was really important. And I had some really, really good years at Finn. I also got to go uh, to their office uh, or Shipstead's office in Barcelona for a while. But I did start thinking about this thing with startups. I started hearing about it when I was there. Uh, and I was a bit worried, like, is that something for me? Is that because when I was a student, the people I knew that worked in startups, they worked around the clock. It was very, very busy. Uh, but I was um, lucky enough to be contacted by one, and I, I jumped. Uh, so then I joined, as you were mentioning, Cognite back in then 2018 as a data scientist. Um, and that was the startup back then. And it grew. And I got... Um, when you join a startup, uh, it's, it's, uh, 
it's very chaotic, but you then learn a lot. And if you um, want to take on more responsibility, if you want to grow, uh, that's like the best opportunity you have. And I had people around me that kind of challenged me. So I went from kind of data science and over to what you call ML engineering. I did a lot of API work and a lot of stuff. So I went on really deep water. When I joined Cognite, I didn't know what an API was, and that was kind of our main product. Yeah, so probably mention what Cognite do, if you don't know. It's a, <laughs> it's a, a company that works with heavy asset industries to digitalize uh, their data. Uh, so Akir and, <laughs> and uh, like uh, oil, but also power and utilities. Um, yeah, so through my years there, I got uh, to do a lot of different things, and then um, I spent five years there. And I also want to mention one thing, you know, being women in AI. When I um, interviewed for Cognite, I was in the phase where there might be a growing family. Um, and, um, and I was interviewing with my one, yeah, the founder. Um, and, uh, and he asked me, uh, <laughs> what's holding you kind of, is there something that's holding you back from uh, accepting this position? And I thought, like, I, w I just wanted to see how he reacted uh, to me, kind of. I told him that, like, you know, I'm this age and I'm married and I don't have any children and that might change. And uh, he just responded right away, you shouldn't think about it, we think long term. And I think, I don't know, uh, just having uh, people around that uh, response like that is, uh, was very important to me. Uh, so, yeah, then uh, June 2018 comes this guy. And then also, I just wanted to have another, because uh, it's not actually the same child. <laughs> <laughs> Could be, and I generated, can you have, yeah. So uh, anyway, just think it's funny. So yeah, five years at Cognite. I learned a lot. I went from data scientist over to uh, kind of software engineering, and then say later tech lead and leadership. Uh, and then uh, I decided to do another jump. Uh, and that's kind of where I am today. So uh, a year ago, a bit more, I joined Valur, and we are doing then AI for the meat industry. Uh, and that might sound <laughs> a bit strange and niche, but it's actually really cool. So in the meat industry, there's so many manual decisions being made. There's so much waste along that value chain from the animals come into the slaughterhouse and also probably before, and all the way out. Um, so we are trying to kind of gather their data and, and make it more optimized. So both on a kind of day-to-day -day plan, but also uh, longer term. So, um, and yeah, through another startup again, new technology um, and so forth. Yeah, so a bit of my kind of what I learned uh, along my way in, in tech and in AI is to kind of, um, you need to be proactive. If one sees something one wants to do, you shouldn't just sit and wait for it. I've been to some, to some talks in the past where maybe some women have told me that um, like opportunities they wanted just came falling down in their lap, basically. Someone just came and said, I want you to lead this. And to me, that's not really how it happens. Uh, you need to kind of be active yourself, take courses, say, this is what I want, tell your manager, like if you want a new role, if you want a new position, if there's a project you're passionate about, you shouldn't be shy, yeah, be active in that. And then also put in the effort, uh, like it, it doesn't come for free if there's something cool you want to do, um, you might need to put in that extra time, um, yeah, to kind of get there. And also go to meetups, uh, upskill yourself in that way, and like uh, as you guys are doing today, uh, and widen your kind of um, network. Um, and then I wanted to say, what you like to do can really change over time. So when I was a student, I, I loved being a student. Uh, I wanted to stay there. I considered doing a PhD, and I considered that multiple times. But I think what you can do can really change over time. So kind of feel like in the moment, maybe you thought when you were at a certain age, like this is what I want to do, but that can change and, and kind of follow your art in a way, or what you just find fun, and then you will end up in a job that you really enjoy, um, very likely. Um, and then 
you grow a lot if you go outside your comfort zone. So kind of throwing yourself in there, being really uncomfortable for a few months, it's just going to be, um, or longer, it's just going to kind of bring so much uh, along the way. And I think just talking about like women and AI, it can maybe uh, to some, I, I assume many of you are already in the field, but if you're not, it can seem like overwhelming or daunting. But I think just getting started, jumping into it, um, yeah, it's, it, yeah, you will just learn a lot along the way and it will be um, really fun. So that was actually all I wanted to say. So.